και είναι τιμή μου να σας καλωσορίσω στο Αμφιθέατρο της Αμερικανικής Σχολής για την 40η ετήσια διάλεξη Walton που ξεκίνησε ως θεσμός το 1982 για να τιμήσει τον εξαίρετο, εξαιρετικό διευθυντή της για να δύο βιβλιοθήκης, τον Francis R. Walton. Ο Frank Walton διεύθυνε τη βιβλιοθήκη από το 1961 έως το 1976 και συνεισέφερε ουσιαστικά στο να ανοίξει γενάδιος προς το αθηναϊκό κοινό και να καταξιωθεί στη, τη βιβλιοθήκη, να, να την καταξιώσει διεθνώς σαν κέντρο μελέτης του ελληνισμού. Ε, και είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά που σήμερα έχουμε μαζί μας την κόρη του Francis Walton, τη Sarah Clark, ε, που την καλωσορίζω. Ε, είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά, βέβαια, σήμερα που έχουμε την ομιλήτριά μας να καλωσορίσω στο Κότσεν Hall την ε, σημαντική ιστορικό θωμανολόγο από το Πανεπιστήμιο Brandeis, την Amy Singer, ε, που ε, νομίζω ότι η ομιλία της η σημερινή ε, είναι κάτι το ιδιαίτερο για το δικό μας το κοινό, επειδή κινείται ανάμεσα στο Βυζάντιο και στην ε, Οθωμανική εποχή. Θα μου επιτρέψετε να συνεχίσω βέβαια στα αγγλικά. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to uh, the auditorium of the American School of uh, Classical Studies, uh, Kotzen Hall, on the occasion of the 40th uh, annual Walton Lecture. Uh, the institution of the Walton Lectures uh, was started uh, in 1982 Uh, to celebrate uh, and to honor a most visionary director of the Yanadios Library, Francis R. Walton. And I'm extremely happy that for the first time uh, in uh, the delivery of the Walton Lectures, for at least my time at uh, the library, uh, that we have with us the daughter of uh, Francis Walton, Sarah Clark, Uh, and thank you very much, Sarah, for honoring us. And Sarah is here uh, also because uh, she will witness the naming in honor of her uh, father of a suite uh, in Loring Hall. Uh, and uh, of course, this is very exciting for all of us. Uh, Frank Walton was head of the library from 1961 to 1976. And under his leadership, Uh, the library uh, expanded uh, in its um, collections and opened up to the Athenian public. Uh, and Francis Walton was instrumental in bringing to the library two very important collections. The collection of uh, Mrs. Hélène Stathatos, Eleni Stathatou, uh, and uh, the uh, personal papers uh, of George Seferis, uh, the Greek uh, uh, Nobel laureate. Um, And uh, he also, uh, his, his vision uh, was very close to that of Ioannis Yanadios, uh, paving the way to develop uh, and, and uh, to have the library evolve into a premier scholarly institution. So we're very, very proud to uh, have uh, this uh, lecture series uh, in his honor. Tonight is my privilege to uh, honor an honor to introduce a speaker who has been a leader and a leading um, a thinker about Ottoman studies, uh, historian Amy Singer, who is uh, Hassenfeld Chair in Islamic Studies and Professor in the Department of History at Brandeis University. Uh, she is also Professor Emerita uh, in the Department of Middle Eastern and African Studies, history rather, in Tel Aviv University, where she also served as head of the Women's Studies Forum. Amy Singer to, uh, took her BA from Swarthmore uh, College and received a second BA from Princeton in Near Eastern Studies and her PhD from Princeton in 1889. 18, yes, 1989. Uh, she has published three monographs uh, that uh, have also been translated into Turkish, has written uh, numerous articles, and uh, has edited uh, with uh, other colleagues uh, three other books. Her first book uh, focused on the relations between Ottoman officials and Palestinian peasants uh, in uh, the 16th century province of Jerusalem. And uh, she tried in this book uh, to move away from a more traditional view of, of Ottoman agrarian history, uh, which and not just catalog demographics uh, and agricultural production, but go deeper. 
Her second book took her to uh, the study of uh, benevolent uh, institutions, uh, especially a public kitchen, Imaret, uh, that was established by Hurem Sultan, wife of uh, Sultan Suleiman I, uh, and uh, raised questions about Ottoman uh, foodways. And the title of that book is Constructing Ottoman Beneficence, an Imperial Soup Kitchen in Jerusalem. And her third book is a much more uh, general uh, book uh, that has addresses uh, broader questions about uh, philanthropy in the Muslim world. Um, and uh, it's called Charity in Islamic Society, and it was Societies, and it was published in 2008. Uh, the book has been praised for its freshness and relevancy. Uh, is something that uh, we don't hear very often about scholarly book, uh, and uh, it adds to the careful study of uh, textual analysis uh, that a historian ought to bring to the fore, and we will know, uh, and we will hear about her method uh, in, the, in her talk, uh, but she adds uh, anecdotes and, and personal experiences to make a book, an award-winning book, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, awards uh, outside academia, so that's uh, wonderful. Um, Singer's current research focuses on Ottoman Edirne, Byzantine Adrianople, and uh, it aims to understand uh, how the city became an Ottoman capital uh, and the incubator of the Ottoman Empire, for fostering the formation of Ottoman state and society in the first half of the 15th century. And this is uh, the topic that she will be talking to us about today. Uh, she's also interested uh, in digital humanities and, and how the digital um, uh, world uh, can expand uh, and, and help uh, Ottoman studies and she, has, she served as president of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association from 12, 2018 to 2020. Um, I will pass uh, the numerous articles that I already mentioned and her awards and um, I uh, want uh, to invite her uh, to the podium for her talk, Byzantine Adrianople Becomes Ottoman Edirne, The Birth of a Capital. Amy. So I have something to spill later on. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. I know it's a beautiful evening outside, um, and it's still light. So <clears throat> I'm especially flattered that you've chosen to spend a bit of it uh, inside. Thank you for the invitation, um, Kalispera. Um, it's a privilege to speak here at the Gennadius Library of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. Um, I'm very grateful to our host, uh, Maria uh, Georgopoulou, who, um, who I, whom I met uh, last summer in Thessaloniki. Um, and I'm grateful for her offering me this opportunity to return to Greece, uh, and to Maria Smalley for making sure that everything uh, would be successful this evening. <clears throat> so if it isn't, it's not her fault, it's probably mine. Um, before we consider our topic in depth, please forgive me if I digress for a moment to share with you that it's a special pleasure to return to Lycabettus. I first came here as a child in 1966 with my mother when she attended a conference. We stayed not far from here with a Greek friend of hers visiting sites in Athens and Crete. And as many of you know far better than I do, Greece was a very different place over half a century ago, as was my experience of it. We walked all over the Acropolis, unrestricted, uh, and I had white marshmallow paste in a glass of cold water while the adults sipped Greek coffee. My mom's friend had what was, for an American child, the tiniest car I had ever seen. Years later, I returned to the Parthenon to find barriers safeguarding ancient Greek material heritage from small feet like mine, and also learned what a luxury that small vehicle had been in, in Athens with much less traffic. 
In preparation for what seemed like an epic journey, I spent months listening to Greek myths. At the age of seven, I didn't yet grasp the difference between myth and history, or the way myths could serve as history. These ideas were clarified for me in high school and university, only to be muddied again in graduate school as we argued about the nature of historical facts and debated whether historical truths exist, what history writing is, and the role of historians. Now, in 1966, I didn't really expect to meet the Minotaur as we toured Knossos, but I did wonder whether King Aegeus had actually hurled himself off the cliff at Sunion. These two stories from the very remote past exemplify the basic problem I face now in trying to understand early Ottoman Edirne in the first half of the 15th century. It's a period for which we have little of the contemporary written evidence that characterizes Ottoman history by the end of the same century. The enormous corpus of Ottoman documents found in archives and libraries in Turkey and across much of Europe and the Middle East doesn't stretch back before the mid 15th century except in some rare cases. Contemporary Ottoman historical accounts, chronicles and the like, are similarly rare. It is in this place of exploring the past and the surviving written and material evidence of that past where I meet up today with my much younger self sorting myth from history. I am grateful when they corroborate each other, but also respect the myths and storytelling for what they reflect about how people imagined the city and its past and the ways in which they tried to convince others of its centrality and strength. And I'll share some of that um, a bit later. So I turn your attention this evening to the city of Byzantine Adrianople as it became Ottoman Edirne. The Ottomans developed the city deliberately in the first half of the 15th century before the conquest of Constantinople. I openly confess that I aim to persuade you that Edirne is well worth your consideration and even a visit. This is partly because this small city with a population oops, um, with a population of some 150,000 in both the mid-19th and the mid-20th centuries, contains some of the most impressive Ottoman monuments you could ever hope to see, with no lines and no crowds. If people know anything about Edirne, it is usually that it is the home of the Selimiya Mosque, this mosque that you see, which many believe is the greatest masterpiece <clears throat> of Sinan, the 16th century architect, esteemed as one of the great creative geniuses of Ottoman aesthetic culture. Has anyone here been to Edirne? Okay. So, if you have been, then you must imagine the city without this grand mosque and its Arasta Bazaar, without the complex of Bayezid II with its famous hospital, and without the large palace complex begun by Murat II. There was no long market of Ali Pasha, no caravanserai of Rustem Pasha, no Ekmek Geoluhan, and no great bridge over the Merit River. Wait. Okay. Now, most general histories of the Ottomans merely refer to Edirne in this period as the second capital of the Ottoman Empire, chosen by the Ottomans and their Byzantine predecessors for its strategic location at the exits from the Balkan, Rhodope, and Strangia Mountains. It guarded the rolling hills of eastern Thrace that stretched between the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmara to the city of Constantinople at the eastern edge of Europe. Edirne was a hub for east-west overland traffic on a secondary branch of the Roman Via Ignatia between Constantinople and Rome, and for north-south travel from beyond the Balkans in the north to the Marmara and Aegean Seas and beyond in the south. It was also a key for understanding the history of the entire Evros Valley as the river comes through the mountains below Sofia and turns south toward the Aegean, right around Edirne. Now today, the Evros, or the Merich in Turkish, marks the international boundary separating Greece and Turkey. But in the period we're considering, it was a highway for people and goods navigable at least as far as Plovdiv, Bulgarian Filibet, Bulgarian Plovdiv, that is Filibe in Turkish, or Filipopolis in an earlier era. Without Edirne, Didimotikon, or Dimetoka, 
which is 45 kilometers south of Edirne, on the west side of the marriage, makes no sense historically, and vice versa, for the Byzantines and the Ottomans of the 15th century alike. So of the three dots that you see on the map, um, the most northern one is Edirne, the next one is Dimetoka, and in the south at the Aegean coast is Ainos or Enes, which was the port where the marriage uh, spilled into the Aegean. And it's hard to recall um, the Evros Valley without mentioning um, how much we miss uh, our colleague Robert Osterhout, who passed away not long ago, and how much we value uh, the contribution of his scholarship to this particular corner of the world. Although only about 240 kilometers west of Istanbul, Edirne has not been on many tourist itineraries. And most visitors to Turkey will have been, for example, to Bursa, Ephesus, Cappadocia, and Antalya before even considering Edirne as a destination. Now the reasons for this, and for the relatively small bibliography of scholarship on such an important place, provide much food for thought, but those are for a different presentation. And lest you imagine that Byzantine Adrianople succeeded in attracting much more scholarly attention, let me reassure you that it seems to have generated even less interest than its Ottoman successor. Yet there are good reasons for spending time in this city, as it played significant roles throughout Ottoman history. This year, we might remember it especially as we consider the long-term implications of the Treaty of Lausanne, concluded a century ago. By then, Edirne sat on the international border now drawn between Greece and Turkey. Tens of thousands of Anatolian and Thracian Turks, Thracian Greeks, I'm sorry, um, Thracian Greeks collected there, were collected there, as they were forced to leave the newly constituted Turkish Republic under the terms of Lausanne. This evening, we focus on Ottoman Edirne in the years 1402 to 1453, the first half of the 15th century, only a few decades after it was definitively conquered by the Ottomans. I'm going to take issue with the simple characterization of Edirne as the second capital of the Ottoman Empire, and ask instead, what was an Ottoman capital anyway in the beginning of the second Ottoman century? It would be a mistake to assume that the word capital describes a place that resembled either imperial capitals, like Constantinople, Rome, Cairo, or Baghdad, or the national capitals of modern nation states, certainly not in size, but neither with regard to particular functions. And what was the Ottoman enterprise about anyway in this half century? A close consideration of Edirne and its capitalness offer a way to think about the Ottoman enterprise before the conquest of Constantinople, before the Ottomans were an empire. Indeed, when we turn our historian's gaze to the first century and a half of Ottoman history, the largest challenge is to forget that the conquest is just over the horizon. Now, scholars have debated the causes for Ottoman successes during the first 150 years of Ottoman history. They've untangled the narrative details of territorial advances and retreats and described the development and embellishment of conquered areas with monuments, mostly mosques, tombs, colleges, public kitchens, bathhouses, and markets, that is, to the extent that they can. The scholarly narrative of Ottoman history until the conquest of Constantinople is replete with stories like Osman's dream and relies on interpretive theories built on a few wobbly facts. The competing explanations for Ottoman successes are familiar by now. Religious fervor, Turkic military prowess, tribal loyalty, pecuniary motive, motivations, and Byzantine legacies. But what happened, not only to establish this polity, but also to shape its institutions and culture, is still only understood only in a fragmentary way. The written evidence for my discussion is sparse. I draw on early Ottoman chronicles composed mostly in the late 15th and 16th centuries, although they clearly contain some material from earlier texts now lost. I look at these together with the physical footprint and material remains of the city itself. Many of the buildings from the first half of the 15th century or earlier are degraded, much restored, or have entirely disappeared. However, I am more interested in the locations of these structures, their patrons and their functions, than in their architectural details. 
And in fact, the architectural details have received far more attention than the bigger picture. Among the non-Ottoman sources for Edirne are Byzantine chronicles, chiefly those of Dukas, Kalkakondilas, Kutobulus, and Sfrancis, and the writings of a few foreigners who passed through the city during the years we're considering. The accounts of these men contribute outsiders' descriptive observations and perspectives, which expand our ability to imagine the city we are seeking. Okay. So again, there are three dots on the screen. For those of you watching from home, they're in bright yellow in the center. Uh, from left to right, they represent the city of Edirne, uh, just to the southeast, uh, Constantinople or Istanbul, and then directly south of that, the city of Bursa. Our first glimpse of the Ottomans in the historical record is in Bithynia, or northwest Anatolia, right around the year 1300. They were one of the dozen or so principalities, or beyliks, that divided Anatolia among them. And you can see rough uh, indications of this in some of the color blocks there, but they're a bit um, glossed over. Oh, hang on, I'm sorry. Let's stay here for a moment. Um, right, so this sorts it out, uh, and we'll go back to the yellow dots in a minute. Um, these socio-political units, so you can see the much smaller ones now, were larger um, the farther east were, the farther to the east that we look. And the print, these were the result of Anatolia, um, in Anatolia of the political fragmentation of the Middle East after the Mongols defeated the Seljuk empires that had been centered on Baghdad and Konya. And now you begin to understand why my students tend to look at me quizzically in the first class of Ottoman history and think, we're not gonna make it, we're leaving. And I have to say it gets much easier because it's going to be all one big territory eventually. Um, over the course of the 14th century though, the Ottomans gradually expanded the area under their control, in the process attracting increasing numbers of allies who fought in order to share in the booty and other benefits of joining a local success story. In the first half of the century, the Ottomans seemed to have adapt, adopted some aspects of sedentary rule and organization, which became larger and more ramified during the second half of the century. The implementation of the Timar system for managing land distribution to military commanders developed along with the organization of specialized military forces and the use of foot soldiers that is, most famously, the newly formed Janissary, or Yenichery Corps, together with the more established cavalry. There is evidence, too, for the establishment of Muslim institutions, mosques, schools, Sufi lodges, and, uh, and uh, uh, a hierarchy of judges, and the employment of foreign-trained scholars and bureaucrats for a new administration. Money to fund these came from the continuing military successes of the Ottoman sultans and their allies, with the sultan's one-fifth share of booty translated into tangible built evidence of his victories. However, in 1402, the Ottoman story ended almost before it began, when Sultan Bayezid I was de decisively defeated at Ankara by the Turko-Mongol ruler Timurlenk, known more widely as Tamerlane, who was the latest power to cross Central Asia from the east. Discontented allies in Bayezid's coalition army had changed sides to support Timur, who was the latest winner in the local, uh, in the local organization of power, and the rest of the soldiers were routed in the fighting. This initial defeat was followed by the further westward incursion of Timur's troops, including a destructive raid on Bursa, which at the time was a major commercial and manufacturing town that had served as the chief Ottoman urban anchor and capital from the time of its conquest around 1326. The territorial reach of Ottoman control shrank after 1402 as their allies either reverted to solo enterprises or formed other alliances, many as nominal vassals of Timur. Timur kept Bayezid in captivity, along with one of his sons, until the Sultan's death in 1403. He left the other sons free to compete for leadership over the fragmentary remains of the Ottoman enterprise and thereby ensured a period of Ottoman political instability as the, the brothers competed with each other. Bayezid's son Suleiman apparently left Bursa for Edirne 
taking the Ottoman treasury with him, perhaps reflecting the continuing vulnerability of Bursa and signaling Suleiman's intention to make Edirne his power base. And note that he takes the treasury with him. It's portable. It's in boxes and sacks. Now, the recovery rate of the Ottoman enterprise in the early 15th century suggests that the fledgling institutions of the earlier period had actually taken root to a certain extent. The Ottomans gradually retrieved their earlier experience and accumulated the resources and momentum to launch the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople and defeat the Byzantine emperor by 1453. So that's 50 years later. Mehmed I and Murat II were the two sultans who dominated this period, and they're going to be our main characters, Murat the first, Mehmed I and his son Murat II. Um, these two sultans and their commander administrators gradually reestablished and reinforced provincial governance, tax collection, and revenue management, even as they recovered and expanded Ottoman territory. In general, the need for more effective management of this territory and its resources drove the development of Ottoman institutions of government and the in slowly increasing centralization and sedentarization of the empire through the 15th century. And what can we say about the final stages of the thousand-year-old Byzantine Empire? It was much smaller, weakened, and fragmented following the Latin occupation from 1204 to 1261, and never recovered its former cohesion or strength. During the century and a half when the Ottomans were putting their first marks on the landscapes of Anatolia and the Balkans, the Byzantines confronted multiplying challenges with shrinking resources and limited success. By 1400, their combined impact had reduced the Byzantine Empire to little more than the city of Constantinople and a very narrow hinterland to the west. Adrianople had been the third largest city in the European territories of Byzantium after Constantinople and Thessaloniki. In the years 1280 to 1330, while the Byzantines gradually lost control of Western Asia Minor, Thrace, and Macedonia, sorry, um, Thrace and Macedonia remained the base of their shrinking state. Recent research has also pointed to the impact of climate change, uh, severe weather events in these same years, but they were only one of the many challenges, um, which also included the marauding cattle and mercenaries who came ostensibly to fight on behalf of the Byzantine Empire. Competition for the imperial throne, that is the imperial Byzantine throne, eventually led to open conflict as the Byzantine civil wars of the mid-14th century further destabilized Thrace, it became one arena for the Byzantine political rivals who made Adrianople and Didymotikon their seats as they challenged the emperor in Constantinople. These difficulties were compounded by the Serbian conquest in Macedonia and Thrace, and finally by the first outbreak of plague in Constantinople in 1347 a sign that the century of the Black Death had begun. Now, the Turkish beys, or princes, from one principality or another, had allied with different sides during the Byzantine Civil War, which gave them an opportunity to cross the Dardanelles and learn the geography and topography of the region while getting a close look at Byzantine fortifications and fighting strength. When an earthquake brought down the fortress of Gallipoli in 1354, Orhan's son, Suleiman, that is the son of the second Ottoman sultan, seized the opportunity to establish an Ottoman base on the European shore of the Dardanelles. And from there, he and his followers raided northward. So I'm going to point to this um, on the screen uh, with the pointer. Uh, and you'll see that on the eastern side of the Dardanelles, where it's yellow, uh, they cross to the, what is in white on this map, and they follow the arrows north up into Thrace. Um, Adrianople is probably the last place that's conquered. First, they conquered Didymotikon here, and they go east and eventually uh, conquer Adrianople, even as they've already gone past it. Um, by around 1380, the Byzantine hinterland in Thrace had shrunk to a small space close to Constantinople. 
The Ottomans surrounded it on land, but could not control the continual flow of maritime traffic that arrived at the capital from all directions. And foreign travel accounts make it clear that the frontiers between Byzantine and Ottoman territories were permeable, especially to merchants, scholars, and diplomats who continued to go back and forth. The dangers along their route were not from any kind of border guards, which in any case didn't really exist, but rather from thieves and thugs along the road. Okay, now, just to make it a little bit easier, <laughs> I've written this out, so you can see that we have these competing princes in the very beginning of the 15th century, and then we have uh, eight years of Mehmed I's rule, and then 30 years of Murat II's rule, and 30 more years of Mehmed II's rule, and Mehmed II is Mehmed the Conqueror. And that pretty much sets up the 15th century. We're not going beyond Murat II. Okay. So the Ottoman encroachment on Byzantine territory only paused briefly after 1402, but then retrieved its momentum once the contest between Bayezid's sons had resolved in favor of Mehmed I. By 1444, the revived Ottoman endeavor had surpassed its former strength and under the command of Sultan Murat II, defeated a substantial Catholic coalition at Varna on the Romanian Black Sea coast. It was two years after the accession of Murat's son, Mehmed II, that the Ottomans finally breached the walls of a vastly underdefended Byzantine Constantinople. Both Ottoman campaigns were launched from Edirne. Now, most general histories of the Ottomans assume that Edirne became the second capital from the time of its conquest, in the year 1361, or 1369, or 1371, or 1376. The dates have been debated, but recent research may have resolved the matter by arguing persuasively that the Ottomans, or more likely their allied commanders, conquered the city at least three times. These details are important because they disrupt the general impression that the early Ottomans enjoyed a nonstop expansionist drive to imperial success, a success that endured well into the 17th century before encountering, encountering any serious obstacles. Even partial Ottoman evidence, especially when set against other sources, reveals setbacks. Timur's victory at Ankara in 1402 is only the most dramatic and well documented. Now, let's see if I've got the right one. Yes. So, Adrianople, at the time of the Ottoman conquest, was defined by its Roman walled perimeter. And I've drawn a yellow square line around what was, in fact, the Roman Byzantine walled city. The Ottomans, we are told, immediately transformed the churches there into mosques while leaving the residents in place and unharmed because they surrendered without resistance. Muslim settlement seems to have begun very slowly outside the walls. Of the earliest, we know almost nothing, and there are no 14th century monuments in existence to guide us. Once conquered, Edirne in the 14th century became a military base for the Ottomans in Thrace and beyond, where the commanders joined the Sultan in the spring to organize the army before setting out on campaign in the direction of southeastern Europe. So the Ottoman army is not a standing army, it's an army that comes together in the spring, fights during the summer, well into the fall, and then disperses for the winter, um, roughly in the beginning of November. And it gathers in Edirne if they're going north and west, and it gathers somewhere around Bursa if they're heading eastward across Anatolia. The coalition of Ottoman forces then returned to Edirne in autumn to complete the sharing out of booty and bonuses before dispersing in the winter. And booty and bonuses were one of the large motivators for joining these Ottoman expeditions. The Ottoman chronicles give the impression that in the late 14th century, sultans and beys came and went from Edirne, but none seemed to stay there for any length of time or to do anything of note. Many historians repeat that Sultan Murat I, that is, in the 14th century, built a palace on a high point in the city, some 600 meters north of the walls. 
But since the Selimiya Mosque has occupied that spot since the second half of the 16th century, there is no coherent evidence of that palace's shape or size. The Ottoman chronicler Ashik Pasha Zadeh mentioned a palace as he described the death of Sultan Mehmed I in Edirne in 1421 and the elaborate staging of his, course to get, of his corpse to give live appearances for audiences until the arrival of his son Murat to take the throne. And also a similar ruse when Murat himself died 30 years later. So the Ottomans looked for a smooth transition of power uh, without any kind of lapse uh, in the presence of a sultan. Two European visitors from the 1430s, a Burgundian named Bertrand de la Broquière and the Spaniard Pero Tafur, described their audiences at a palace with detailed accounts of a reception room and a narrative of the accompanying ceremonial but neither had access to any rooms, nor did they report about any. One of the travelers, however, described the sultan in this way. The Grand Turk, that is the sultan, and his people are always in the field in tents, both in winter and summer. And although the city is close at hand, he never enters it unless it is to go with his women to the bath, which thing, with the help of the Genoese, I was enabled to see. They entered the city and remained there until midnight, when the Grand Turk returned to his tents. The more important point is that it was only several decades after Edirne's conquest that Sultan Bayezid I, he defeated by Timur, rebuilt a former church or monastery into a mosque at the edge of Edirne. This was the first dynastic monument recorded in the city, yet it was not in the center, but rather across the Tunja River in the village formerly called Aina now a quarter of the city. And that quarter was renamed Yildirim after Bayezid I. Much repaired, it still survives. So um, you can see it marked as uh, Bayezid I on the left side of your screen with a blue arrow and a red square uh, for those of you watching at home. Why would the Sultan have built his only Adirne monument in this suburban neighborhood and not close to the center of the walled town? Now, one possible reason is that there was no concentration of Muslims living, either permanently or temporarily, in what we think of today as the Ottoman city center. That was where the markets and commercial buildings flourished. Uh, and that would be roughly uh, near this square, which says Murat II, which didn't quite exist yet. Now, if Bayezid I built his mosque at a distance, he was perhaps mimicking settlement patterns in Bursa, where the sultans built mosque complexes as outposts meant to establish new neighborhoods outside its walled city. But if the mosque was meant to be easily accessible to Muslims, who were they and what were they doing there? More than one answer may be relevant. For one, it's possible that this was an attempt to distance Ottoman building from that of the Byzantines, similar to what other Turkic rulers had done in Anatolia, when they built on the edges of cities like Amasya and Tokat and Sivas, which had major uh, monuments from the Seljuk period that was earlier. The, another possibility is that the mosque was easily accessible from the main road that led toward Edirne from, for anyone coming from Bulgaria or leaving the city in that direction. And we should think of these roads as being pretty um, regularly tra um, um, as having regular traffic of Muslims because this is when the Ottoman army is, um, is heading regularly into the Balkans. And the must, as a third possibility, the mustering grounds for the army could easily have been located in the large open plains on the west side of the Tunja River, not far from the mosque. So if we look at Edirne, we have this Tunja River which wraps around uh, the city and it creates a large floodplain here which is uh, very unbuilt. And then there's another large plain uh, which has buildings in it and which was uh, gradually uh, built up uh, and included in later years uh, many large um, Ottoman barracks. Um, but it would have served just as well for people to pitch large numbers of tents and had easy access to water. Um, eventually the village where Bayezid I uh, put his mosque became one of the regular suburban neighborhoods of Edirne on the west side of the Tunja, uh, which was also close to a hilltop shrine 
that was supposed to hold the grave of the mysterious saintly figure of Husser, who's identified um, as um, often going hand in hand with Elias, um, among other things, the protectors of travelers and the rescuers of people in distress. Now, Bayezid's son, Sultan Mehmed I, completed the first congregational mosque in Edirne as part of the Ottoman expansion in the city beyond the Byzantine wall. And this uh, late 19th century photo um, by a Georgian photographer, Dmitry Ermakov, gives you a, whoops, my apologies. Okay, so um, with the pointer, I'm showing uh, the large open plain behind the built mosques uh, between them and the river. Uh, this is the area of the old city here. Uh, and this is the mosque that uh, Sultan Mehmed I completes right here. Okay, take out this big uh, market, this big uh, caravanserai, it wasn't there then. Um, sorry, right, this big Han. Okay, so this is a large Han, this is a caravanserai, and they were not there. Those are two of the things that we have to take out of the picture um, from our 15th century city. Um, but Mehmed uh, built this congregational mosque. In contrast to Bayezid's mosque across the river, this new mosque, which is now called the Old Mosque, or Eskijami, sat only 250 meters outside the Byzantine city wall. Beside it, he built a market building, or Bedestan, whose revenues he endowed to sustain the mosque and its operations. The city enjoyed increasing security as the dynasty stabilized further under Mehmed's son, Sultan Murat II, and the Ottoman frontier moved steadily northward and westward effectively ending several centuries of political and territorial rivalries in eastern Thrace. Ottoman conquests in the Balkans also created a continuous flow of cash and booty, much of it in the form of enslaved captives. Edirne's central commercial zone continued to expand. High-ranking notables added smaller mosques, medrases, baths, and fountains to Edirne's cityscape during these years, complementing the monumental projects of the Sultan. This was probably the most intensive period of physical development for Edirne in all of Ottoman history. Um, and just to give you a sense of what that means graphically, so I've got four slides here that show you different periods of building uh, in Edirne. Um, this one is before 1402. Um, so up, this is whatever we know of that was built in the, four, in the 14th century, including uh, the buildings of Bayezid I. Uh, this is from 1402 to 1413. That would have been um, Bayezid's son, um, the, before Bayezid's son Mehmed, during the time of the princes. And in fact, the only thing that gets built and only gets built halfway is the mosque that Mehmed completes there. And then during the period of Mehmed, um, Mehmed I, you can see a very few buildings. And then in the period of Murat II, um, there's a lot of building some of it by the sultan and a lot of it by his commanders and other people who saw investments in the city as a good thing. And they built shrines and mosques and schools and commercial buildings uh, and there was no period in which this cityscape was so extensively altered and developed. Even after 1453, Edirne continued as the anchor of Ottoman administration and court life for some years more while Mehmed the conqueror, directed the rebuilding and repopulation of Istanbul to make it the urban center of the Ottomans. But by 1450, Edirne had replaced Bursa as the official Ottoman ceremonial venue and hosted the wedding of Murat II's son, Mehmed, to be the conqueror. In 1457, that is after the conquest of Constantinople, Edirne hosted the circumcision celebrations for Mehmed's son. These parties lasted two months. Okay, this isn't an afternoon and an evening, these are big parties. Um, with elaborate feasts and public entertainments, a telling signal that because it was in Edirne, Istanbul was not yet a fitting stage for such an event, right? If your house hasn't been redecorated and the garden redone, it's not a place where you wanna host a big important party because you want people to be impressed and to enjoy the beauty of the place. 
And even after Mehmed made Istanbul the principal seat of government and ceremony, Edirne also continued for, center, for centuries to be a center of learning and an alternate stage for diplomatic and dynastic celebrations, as well as a seasonal imperial residence, often serving as the winter quarters of the sultans. Now, the term capital doesn't represent a transparent and fixed concept. The capitals we know today are urban centers of governance and administration in modern nation states. An archetypal capital that fulfilled our expectations would be a political, administrative, judicial, and diplomatic center with some monuments to the past, an official residence where the ruler's family could be found, along with the residences of high-ranking officials and their families, and perhaps those of diplomats, rather like this area of, uh, of Athens. It would almost certainly have space for official ceremonies and celebrations, some cultural activity, perhaps of the type to emphasize the creative energies and aesthetics of the country, and perhaps cult or religious institutions if those were significant aspects of national identity. Some capitals today are the historic capitals of now gone monarchies and empires. Others were purpose built as part of the founding process of new countries like Ankara, or for political reasons in existing states like Brasilia. Athens, for example, as you well know, was an imperial capital, and even when the empire was gone, the city preserved its legacy, remained an urban hub, although much reduced in importance and grandeur, but it eventually became a national capital. Rome, too, was an imperial capital that became a national capital. In between, it expanded its role to become the center of Christianity and the seat of the Catholic Pope. Now, not all political capitals are also economic and cultural capitals. Those centers are elsewhere in many countries. Think of Ankara and Istanbul, Washington and New York, Bonn and Berlin. And a city may serve only as the spiritual capital while a government seat is elsewhere. This is obviously the case with Mecca and Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. We instinctively imagine political capitals to be single cities, but even this is not necessarily the case. South Africa has three capitals, administration in Pretoria, parliament in Cape Town, and the judiciary in Blumenfontein. But the highest court is in Johannesburg, and all of this gives a new meaning to the term separation of powers. And the question of whether Tel Aviv or Jerusalem is the political capital of Israel is vigorously contested in Israel itself, in the Middle East, and around the world. In the modern era, the term capital has also generally meant a stable, and stationary single city, although the US moved its capital several times before inventing the city of Washington, DC. In ancient and pre-modern polities, capitals were often mobile because they were defined by the presence of the ruler rather than any specific structures or fixed institutions. Rule was personal, and loyalties to the rulers had to be renewed when a sovereign expired. Under the early Ottomans, Ottoman allies and high-ranking Ottoman notables and servants confirmed their allegiances as part of the accession ceremonies of a new sultan. They supported the person, not the dynasty, nor an abstract idea called the state. The idea of a single capital city for the early Ottomans is probably more our own projected expectation based on what we know of Constantinople and what followed in Istanbul then it is a realistic assessment of the evidence available to understand it. Even if that evidence is partial, it suggests a more nuanced understanding of the situation prior to 1453 than we have generally allowed for. As a point of departure, I would suggest that the term Ottoman capital in this period is better defined as a shifting constellation of places and spaces where the sultan may be found. Cities a military encampment, a palace, a tent, a throne, even perhaps hunting on horseback. Insisting on the mobility of the Ottoman capital helps us to appreciate the lack of fixedness in many aspects of the early Ottoman polity. At the same time, certain places became more frequently and regularly associated with one sultan or a succession of sultans for a stretch of time. One reason for this is that the apparatus of governance in this early period seems to have been, been very lean and portable. One official might fulfill several functions, serving as a fighter while also being a judge, 
and fulfilling other bureaucratic or secretarial functions. The treasury was physical, coins in boxes or sacks, and a working archive could be carried by pack animals. It was the presence of the ruler that defined capital, and the central apparatus of government traveled with him. Our contemporary ex expectations of a capital make it harder to recognize this, since we are so much more familiar with an extended administrative apparatus identified by professional officials who work in buildings labeled office of, organized into ministries or secretariats, each with defined spheres of authority and responsibility and housing their current work and the archives of their past. When an archive does not exist, we assume it has been lost, but it may very well never have existed. The more difficult thing to date and to understand, especially in the absence of clear contemporary evidence, is the transition from one mode to another. In the Ottoman ca capital constellation, the cities we could consider are Bursa, Edirne, Dimetuka, and Istanbul. But to these we might add Manisa and Amasya, which were cities long associated with the Ottoman princes. Now, at some point, a young prince left the Sultan's harem with his mother, who took charge of the princely household in a city where the possible Ottoman heir continued to study and train. In the process, he learned how to govern and to lead men in the field and began to father children of his own. Since the Ottomans did not practice primogenitor, this period was an important proving ground for princes and the competition for succession, for succession that lay ahead. Manisa and Amasya were the early standout def destinations for princes, partly because they give easy access back to, uh, back to uh, Edirne, but then eventually back to Istanbul. But eventually, the princes' cities also included Konya and Trabzon, when you have many princes. Like their princes, the Ottomans also distributed activities associated with the dynasty, the government. So the government, learning, and leisure, all of them distributed among different sites, deliberately putting distance between them and choosing each to best effect for the role it fulfilled. So Bursa is the first city in Ottoman history that historians recognize as a capital, though it is not clear that it was designated as such at the time of its conquest in 1326. The former Byzantine palace, located in the citadel of the walled city, became the basis for an Ottoman palace there. Uh, and the citadel is circled in green uh, in the lower center of this map. It says citadel tombs of Osman and Orhan. Those were the tombs of the first uh, two sultans that were uh, eventually uh, put there. Below the palace, uh, and we have to imagine that this citadel actually sits on a raised spot, so below it, uh, in this area to the right uh, of that green circle, um, below it, a commercial and manufacturing center emerged. The Ottoman city expanded through the 14th century as neighborhoods grew up around the mosque complexes and shrines associated with each successive sultan and with leading notables. And you can see all of these labeled along a line which is roughly defined by the, the slope of the mountain side that this sits on. So this is all at not quite the same height, but you have to imagine the slope goes from the bottom part of the screen, which is the top, to the top of the screen, which is the bottom. Sorry, that sounds convoluted. Um, Beginning with Orhan, the second sultan, each sultan built a mosque complex that also included a madrasa, a school, a public kitchen, a bath, and in some cases a hospital or primary school. These were public institutions organized as endowments. By the end of the 14th century, a line of neighborhoods stretched horizontally along the slope of Uda, the mountain that guarded Bursa's southern side. The city became generally more secure, but even in the 14th century, it was still vulnerable to attacks, as we've seen, and eventually sacked by Timur in 1402. This may have made Edirne a more attractive choice as a, as, um, as a capital while the Ottomans recovered their power and stability in the aftermath of defeat. Now, what kind of a capital was Bursa in the 14th century? The large number of sultan's monuments attest to the material flourishing of the Ottomans. Revenues from the markets, as well as merchandise imported and exported through the city, bolstered its revenues. More crucially, 
These mosque complexes reflected the rulers' perceptions of how they should memorialize their presence and power and fulfill their obligations to their subjects and their faith. These were models for ur urban development. But already in the 1330s, the Moroccan traveler Ibn Battuta, who left us a huge account of his travels from Morocco, some say as far as China. Um, so he described Sultan Orhan, the second sultan, in the following way. He was the greatest of the kings of the Turkmens and the richest in wealth, lands, and military forces. Of fortresses, he possesses nearly 100. Notice that his territory is defined by, by points, not by spaces. Um, so he has nearly 100 fortresses, and for most of his time, he is continually engaged in making the round of them, staying in each fortress for some days to put it into good order and examine its condition. It is said that he has never stayed for a month in any one town. Sadly for us, Ibn Battuta did not make it to Adrianople. However, his description emphasizes the Sultan's mobility as he moved continually from one side of his realm to another, creating and maintaining order and reinforcing loyalties. Bursa may have been an impressive center, but the business of government required constant motion. As the Sultan traveled, the capital traveled with him. Now, in addition to anchoring the expansion of the Ottoman city, each mosque complex also housed the tomb of its sultan founder and those of family and members of their households. Eventually, the first seven sultans were all buried in Bursa, even Mehmed I and Murat II, who both died in Edirne. This gave Bursa a unique and permanent status as a site of pilgrimage. A particular role as intercessors with the divine was attributed to powerful individuals after death, Yet these sultans' tombs also confound the expectation that an Ottoman capital might contain the tombs of the rulers who ruled there. Now, Mehmed I being buried in Bursa might indicate that Edirne, no matter what other weight it had as a military center uh, and as the most prominent Ottoman city in Thrace at the time, did not include the sanctity that Bursa already acquired. However, when Murat II died, in Edirne in 1451, that city was obviously functioning as the main Ottoman urban political and diplomatic center already. And yet Murat was taken back to Bursa to be buried in the complex that he built there, the Muradia. Mehmed II, Murat's son, lies in the tomb built beside his mosque in Istanbul. Thus, no sultans are buried in Edirne, only a few Ottoman princes and princesses who died young. So once the Ottomans crossed the Dardanelles and began to expand into Thrace and beyond, the former Byzantine city of Didymotikon took on some capital functions. These are more clearly visible to us after 1402 in the same way that Edirne comes into focus. Dimetuka, as the Ottomans called it, was conquered around 1359 or 1361, before Edirne, by the Ottoman allied Haji Ilbe. The population surrendered, leaving the city largely undamaged. Situated on a high hill, roughly 45 kilometers downstream from Edirne, on the Evros, or Marich, Dimetoka was a walled city with a palace citadel. And this is um, a picture of the, of, whoops, of the city somewhat distant, so I'm using the pointer to point out this large triangle in the center of the city, which is the mosque that was built there. Uh, begun by Bayezid I and completed by Mehmed I. Uh, but if you look to the far right of the screen, you can see the line uh, of the city wall, uh, and the citadel would have been up in here, which is where, um, so the citadel was up here, and the palace, both the Byzantine and the Ottoman, were inside the citadel. And then the city is constructed uh, down the slopes below that. Um. So Dimetoka becomes the most important Ottoman stronghold in Thrace until the conquest of Edirne about a decade later. And so here you have a close-up shot of the walls um, and a sense of just how high and steep uh, the, the top of the city is. And then uh, 
basically just turning around from the same photo and looking down the hill, you have the enormous mosque of, um, of Bayes and Mehmed, uh, which burned uh, in 2017. Um, and I haven't heard that it's been reconstructed yet, although there was talk of that. Um, so the Ottomans added their own palace inside the walls in Dimatoka. When Bayezid's son, Suleiman, left Bursa after it was sacked and took the treasury with him and moved it across the Dardanelles, he moved it to Dimetoka, which was a safe location for the sultan's treasury and also was a safe place to keep high-ranking hostages and at times the sultan's household, that is his harem and his children, safer probably than Bursa or Edirne at the time. Bayezid had begun the construction of this enormous mosque, but it was his son, Mehmed I, who completed it and at that time, it was the largest mosque in the Ottoman Balkans, and it stayed the largest mosque for quite a long time. As elsewhere, the Ottomans brought Turkish families to settle in the new, quarter, new city quarters outside the walls, to which they added madrasas and baths. The city also flourished as a center of Muslim learning. Only some time in the first half of the 15th century did Edirne emphatically become something more than a seasonal military center and a frontier town well inside the borders of the Ottoman realm by now. The frontier has moved farther north and farther west. While crucial as a military and administrative site and even as a ceremonial stage for receiving foreigners and hosting celebrations, it was not necessarily the preferred residence of the sultans and their households. Now, I've already mentioned the suburban mosque of Bayezid I and the mosque of Mehmed I in the center of the commercial district, as well as the three Muslim institutions that were founded by Murat II. And during Murat's Sultanate, we saw there was something of a building boom by high-ranking officials and military governor commanders who founded multifunctional Emirate Zavias, which are both have a prayer space and a learning space and a, a hostel space uh, and a kitchen uh, and a, a public kitchen space. Uh, and these were scattered all over the city and outs outside the walls anchoring new neighborhoods just as they had done in Bursa. The founders of Edirne, as they've been called, still live in the names of this modern city quarters. Edirne became an important intellectual and cultural center, reflecting in its high-ranking status for teaching and judicial appointments by the end of the 15th century, and that ranking is reflected in the salary registers for judges and teachers that we have. So Murat II built and endowed three major Muslim institutions in Edirne. The first, the Muradia complex, uh, sat removed up here um, from the center toward the northern edge of the city. It was originally built as the local home of the Mevlevi dervishes, those are known as the whirling dervishes. And it was perhaps intentionally invisible from the commercial center of the town because there's a large hill uh, in the center of this city. So you would have had to, you have to go up and over the hill uh, to reach that. Um, meanwhile, it anchored a new neighborhood in the city, and that neighborhood had a clear view of the northwest approach of the city. Murat also builds the Dar al Hadis, which is way down here uh, on the edge outside the city wall, um, the south city wall. It was a school for the study of Muslim traditions about the deeds and sayings of Muhammad. From this location, the Dar al Hadis added a visible and audible Muslim presence, unique on that side of the city wall. And finally, Murad built his large congregational mosque, completed in 1447, in the city's commercial center, not far from the Eski Jami of his father. So that's this mosque. Okay. And so here, what you can see is you can see the old mosque uh, that was built by Mehmed I, and then this is the, the Uch Sheref Ali, the large mosque built by Murat II. And way out here, inside the yellow circle, you can see where the Dar al-Hadith actually sits, and it's on the far side of this huge, low-built space, which is the old, um, previously walled city of, uh, of Edirne. Um, this 
this old walled city had actually, was actually largely inhabited by Christians and Jews, the original inhabitants of the city of Edirne at the time of the conquest. Um, and all of these mosques together surround that city then with um, the sights and sounds of Muslim faith and learning, and I think that that's actually intentional. Now, toward the end of his reign, Murat began to develop a palace, a new palace in the broad plain just across the Tunja, and approximately three kilometers north of the Mosque of Bayezid. So now we're going to go to the other side of the city, and we are looking down roughly from um, where Murat's Mevlevihane would have been um, to this palace out here. And note that this photo is taken in approximately 1870. Um, this palace burned uh, in 1878 at the time of the Russo-Bulgarian invasion and occupation of Edirne. Uh, it had by then been converted into, uh, a, um, into a storehouse for, for munitions, and as they retreated, the Ottomans set fire to it, and it blew up and then burned. So there's very little of the palace left, although it's been excavated and tiny bits of it have been rebuilt. Um, now, Murat's son, Mehmed the Conqueror, and the sultans who succeeded him, maintained and expanded this complex of buildings, which eventually occupied an area comparable to that of Topkapa Palace in Istanbul. So if you've been to Istanbul and been to Topkapa, you have some sense of how large this palace is, except that this palace also then in, has enormous lands beyond it, uh, and a big hunting preserve, and some sort of forest um, kiosks and, and small palaces. So what is it we see in these cities that seems to correlate with our expectations of a capital? Well, size is one factor, as is a visible level of investment in the physical fabric of the cities, by sultans and others, noticeably greater than most other places. Another feature that one might expect in a capital is a palace, but unfortunately for historians, palaces, unlike mosque complexes, needed no authorization or legal structure to cohere as building projects, and so they don't leave much uh, written evidence uh, for their building. Um, and they're not major cultural institutions that are meant to enhance a ruler's reputation and legitimacy. Um, they leave some tracks in the archives because they had salary registers and registers of the distributions on holidays and the costs of buying food and upkeep and the like. Um, but we don't necessarily have early records of what was going on in the way that we have earlier records of the large foundations that are built. So if we think about this large palace and then think about this supposed first palace that had existed um, in the 14th century, we don't really have a clear sense of what that palace would have been for, especially if the Ottomans are largely on the move, the, the sultan and the government are largely on the move, and living, at least for part of the time, in tents. The only descriptions we have suggest that the palace had ceremonial functions and it hints at residential features, such as when the historian Ashik Pasha Zadeh describes the final days of Murat II as he's sick and in bed, and then the charade of his death, which is played out apparently from inside the palace to a visible spot outside. But the extensive investment in this palace, which was only begun by, uh, by Mehmed the Conqueror's father, offers an insight into Mehmed the Conqueror's expectations for how he and his court might continue to reside in Istanbul only seasonally, or at any rate, not exclusively. It indeed seems that even after the conquest, the Sultan continued frequently to spend the winter months in Edirne, and perhaps before and after the summer campaigns in southeastern Europe. This pattern represented no significant change from before the conquest. The difference was that the Sultan might eventually expect to continue on home to Istanbul each year. Now, once they conquered Constantinople, the Ottomans slowly became more sedentary, even if they did not commit to a single capital. In part, the imperial legacy of the city itself acted as an anchor, but there were other factors. It became gradually more difficult to move the apparatus of government as it expanded exponentially from the later 15th century 
to include tens, then hundreds, later thousands of people. The archive of administration grew gradually larger and heavier, less mobile, and itself required a more permanent location and organization as a tool of reference for governing. Gradually, the roles of administrators and commanders became more specialized and professionalized, creating specific career tracks and hierarchies. Their staffs grew larger to accommodate the expanded work of governing a much larger territory and became more independent of the Sultan's immediate oversight as he retreated from view. And we know that from the time of Mehmed uh, the Conqueror, the Sultans are less visible and so every appearance that they make is m an occasion for much more ceremony and grandeur. And it sort of adds a lot of um, my mystery to the appearance of the Sultan. So he's not just sort of first among equal or one of the guys, the way it seems that the sultans were in, say, the 14th century. The staffs of all these offices grew larger to accommodate the expanded work of governing a much larger territory, and they became more independent of the sultan's oversight. Viziers and other officials increasingly managed the day-to-day -day business of the Ottoman Empire. Yet even as the conquest of Constantinople created a center with a stronger gravitational pull, the centrifugal legacy of the earlier centuries remained. The habits of seasonal migration remained, but were transformed and then gradually weakened. By the early 17th century, the princes no longer left Istanbul for training, and so princes' cities lost their special function as well. After half a century of continual imperial residence in Edirne, in the second half of the 17th century, and this was exceptional, the Sultan and court returned to Istanbul finally, permanently, in the early 18th century, and became basically permanent residents there. Dimetoka had long ago fallen off the map of imperial destinations, as far as we can tell. Bursa continued to be a shrine city, while Edirne maintained a strategic and symbolic status. Under Mehmed II, Istanbul became the political and diplomatic capital, as well as the stage on which Ottoman imperial ambitions could be performed and elaborated. The first steps involved an intensive building project, reviving, repopulating, and remodeling the city to serve persuasively as an imperial and not merely dynastic Ottoman capital city. This development of Istanbul was possible because the Ottomans already had clearly in mind what they wanted to do what they wanted the city for and how to make it uniquely Ottoman. They rapidly acquired the means to do so on a grand scale while Mehmed and his successors invested in a continuing stream of building projects, all funded by conquests. Not all Ottoman supporters welcomed the conquest of Constantinople and the sedentarization of the Ottomans. This process has also been characterized a little bit simplistically as a victory for Orthodox Sunni Muslim ambition over the earlier syncretic practices of Islam that accompanied the warrior ethos of the Ottoman frontier. And this is a kind of uh, dualism that has been set up um, without a lot of nuance. Um, like the army and administration, they had been less centralized and hierarchical, that is, the different um, Islamic leaders. Um, and they had been more mobile than sedentary. Opposition has been attributed to the, that is, opposition to sedentarization has been attributed to the Ghazis, those warriors who made their living at the frontiers, following the semi-autonomous commanders who were early partisans of the Ottomans. In struggles for influence in the time of Sultan Mehmed II, they belonged to a party that objected to the conquest and Ottoman sedentarization because it curtailed the freedom of groups like them regularizing the military organization, drawing up written codes to govern taxation, and favoring the rituals and learning of Sunni Islam over the Sufi mystics who had been more influential among the Ghazis. Or so goes the most prevalent historical narrative. Edirne was mobilized as the iconic home of the Ghazis. The curious composition attributed to a certain Hakim Bashir Chelebi, which was entitled the Tale of Bishir Chelebi and the History of Adirne. This text describes in detail the unique qualities of the city, natural, man-made, and divine or supernatural. Apparently composed in the late 15th or early 16th century, 
it is one of very few to focus solely on Edirne, with no mention of Istanbul. And it is here that our struggle with a limited amount of evidence for Edirne before 1453 yields to the richness of myth. Nothing is known of Bashir Chelebi except his title, Hekim, doctor, and the very little that he himself mentions in his own text. Very few scholars have paid him much attention. The text calls Edirne the hearth of the Ghazis, but it might easily have named it City of Wonders, based on the tales it recounts. All of these work to enhance the standing of Edirne, and it's easy to imagine them serving as an answer to the narratives spun around the conquest of Constantinople as the realization of Muslim aspirations dating back to the time of Muhammad the prophet. Bashir Chelebi wrote, that Edirne had a wonderful and moderate climate, especially in winter. He described the city's three rivers as sources of wisdom and healing, as well as keeping the city green and ensuring bountiful crops. Several curious stories center on the Eski Jami, that old mosque, that Bayezid I's son, Suleiman, saw the Prophet Muhammad in a dream, commanding him to build the mosque. There is a story of Haji Bairam, the eponymous founder of the Bairami Sufi order, who visited the mosque during his time in Edirne at the request of Murat II. When Haji Bairam went to visit the Eski Jami, he saw the Prophet Muhammad, who had come there to pray and fast with his companions. Muhammad explained to Haji Bairam, this mosque is mine, and I give it my blessing. I will, I will be with my community. Let this place never be empty or abandoned by the Muslims. Let them come here to ask for what is in their hearts. And more, black stones embedded in the wall near the mihrab of the mosque are said to have fallen off the Kaaba in Mecca and refused to stick when replaced there. Rather, in a dream, Muhammad instructed that they should be sent to their present location in the Eski Jami. Whoever touched the stones and then passed his hands over his face it would be as if he had touched that same corner of the Kaaba. The stones are still there in the mosque in Edirne. And yet another story tells that every Friday night, the Eski Jami visits Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. It is also said that Edirne has four places in which prayers offered will be accepted. The Eski Jami itself, the Dar al-Hadith of Murad II, the Kilise Jami, which was a former church-made mosque inside the walled city, which contained a spring whose water cured leprosy. And finally, the shrine of the saintly and ubiquitous Huzur, companion of Elias, um, at a place where he had been seen. Now, a historian's mind might, cite these, might sort these stories into those that may have some factual basis and those that are myths that just could not have been. Yet these stories doubtless have the power to infuse the place with wonder and were among the stories recounted to pilgrims, another kind of tourist. And so they deserve our attention as we grapple with ways to understand places and times of our past which reached us only through myths such as these. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for this uh, very rich uh, lecture that uh, makes us all look forward to the book, uh, which uh, obviously has a lot of depth and a lot of breadth. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I have to say it was a, a wonderful way to sort of think about uh, the first 150 years of, of 100 years and more of the Ottomans uh, and uh, all, all these uh, ways in which uh, sanctity, symbolism, uh, gazes, and so on and so forth uh, came uh, together. Um, we have a very little time for questions, uh, but uh, if there are any, I mean, I have a question already online, but if there are any, please speak up. <laughs> Wait for the microphone, rather. In the back. A little bit louder, please. We can't hear you. I think you. the mic is on. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed that. So I just have a quick question. 
Uh, there are various dates and theories regarding the conquest of Edirne by the Ottomans. I know that like uh, many of the researchers point out to like 1361, 69, or like 71. So I was wondering like, do you have any personal opinion uh, or research on that specific topic? Thank you so much. So I have to say that there's um, a recent article by a young scholar named Samet Budak where he argues pretty convincingly that the city was, was probably conquered th at least three times that it went back and forth between Ottoman and Byzantine, Ottoman and Byzantine hands, or it was, it was conquered not even by the Sultan himself, by, but one of, one of the, the beys, one, one of the people who were his allied commanders. Um, specifically during a period in which um, the Ottomans having crossed the Dardanelles and then crossed back, um, there's a period during which the crossing places of the Dardanelles are actually reconquered by um, the, uh, Prince Amadeo of Savoy, I think this gives you, these are all the sort of relics of the, the Crusades, people hanging about the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and it makes it impossible for the Ottomans to cross over, but their allies, some of them are actually in Thrace and carrying on with various conquests, and it may have been one of them or more who were part of one conquest of Edirne. So, I don't actually think it matters that much. I think what's interesting is that it's a, it's a very unstable conquest and the Ottomans don't seem really interested in, in settling and in investing in the city uh, except to have it as a place from which to mount these campaigns because it's actually an incredibly convenient place to gather an army because it's got water, because it has big open spaces, because it's exactly on the roads. Uh, and it may have also had quite a rich uh, population of saddlers and armorers and people whose professions were to fix and supply weapons and tack for horses and things like that. So um, I no, I've never been, you know, persuaded by one argument or the other. I mean, the the arguments have different merits and sometimes they're similarly persuasive. So I think that the idea that maybe it was conquered more than once is creative and uh, and persuasive, and I also think that it kind of teaches us to think outside the box there. It's like conquest isn't a one-way thing, right? You can conquer and lose something and then conquer it again or not. So, but thank you for the question because it's, it's a question people keep coming back to. Um, are there any remains of Hadrian in Adirna today? <laughs> are there any remains of Hadrian? <laughs> Uh, well, there are bits of the wall. I mean, if, if, if the wall is attributed to him, um, I don't think we have a good history of the wall. I mean, maybe we could persuade Jonathan Bartle, who's worked on the walls of Constantinople, to turn his attentions to Adirne, but it might be too small a project for him, I don't know. Um, so, so yes, I mean, we can trace the line of the city wall. There are some excavations that have, op that have revealed parts of it. Um, and there's one tower that's left, but I think um, you would have to, you know, scrape deep into the scholarly literature to see whether people can say, okay, these stones are left over from Hadrian, um, and I defer to experts on that. As I said, I'm more interested in sort of knowing the place than chasing down and arguing about the details of, of who um, specifically. Um, and and uh, maybe we can end uh, with this question, which uh, is a, a more general question, I think, about, uh, the, about Ottoman studies. Uh, there is a question about, uh, from a person who, doesn't, who cannot read or write Ottoman Turkish, and uh, he asks if there are enough uh, qualified specialist experts uh, in Ottoman Turkish who can translate and, and sort of uh, re-edit uh, the sources. Uh, so he wants to be sort of uh, assured that there are enough Ottomanists with uh, good language skills uh, that uh, we, we can, uh, you know, rely on for, for new Ottoman uh, studies. From language skills in Turkish or language skills in In Greek? Ottoman Turkish. In Ottoman Turkish. So there are large numbers of people who are qualified to read and edit texts, translate them, present them. 
Uh, and in fact, there's been a boom in Ottoman studies roughly since um, I got into the field, which was in the mid-1980s. Uh, and it, it, it's part of a kind of rehabilitation of, um, and legitimization, I think, of the study of the Ottoman Empire uh, and the study of Islam uh, in Turkey that, you know, people talk about the radical secularization that was the ideology of the early Republicans. Um, and that also carried with it a kind of note of anti-Ottomanism, certainly in the way that uh, the Ottomans were blamed uh, for keeping the people who were then called Turks in the new Turkish Republic, keeping people backward. Uh, and in a similar way, the kind of blame that was assigned to the Ottomans by Egyptians and Bulgarians and Greeks and other people who were part of the post-Ottoman world. Um, and that changed, I think, with a variety of um, social and cultural changes in attitudes following the 1980 coup, roughly. I don't think they were caused by the coup, but there were a number of political changes that happened in the 1980s that opened up more spaces for civil society, uh, for um, a more relaxed uh, environment of inquiry. I mean, it sounds ironic in the, the wake of a, a military coup, but I think eventually that's what happened, and it was certainly visible in the 1990s and well into the first decade of the 2000s. Um, so, one of the things that happened was that there was a boom in Ottoman studies in Turkey. And many, many gifted, qualified uh, academics trained. They trained in Turkey, they trained in Europe, they trained in the US. Um, many of them trained abroad and went back uh, and have themselves founded at least one, if not two, generations of young Ottoman uh, studies scholars in Turkey. So yes, there are many people. Did you have a question? No. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, for those of us who are here, I mean, we can uh, discuss further with you during uh, our, our reception downstairs. Uh, and please join me all uh, in thanking Amy. Thank you.